Um, and so with that, um, we can go ahead and kick it off and uh, hear from uh, Ben Greenhagen, who's going to give us uh, some insight on the lunar thermal uh, environment. So Ben, if you're ready, you can go ahead and take uh, take over the screen share. And Ben is, I don't know if you want to give your own introduction, but <laughs> Ben is the was the original uh, focus uh, lead for uh, the extreme environments focus group. Um, and it has a, a history that's far too long with the moon for me, me to list all here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Wes. And yeah, I'll talk a just a little bit about the extreme environments group in, in a couple minutes. Um, so yeah, so uh, Wes asked me to give an overview of the lunar thermal environment. Um, I'm definitely gonna talk about the thermal environment. That's where my main expertise lies. Um, but I'm also going to um, include a few related environments as well. I did also want to give a shout out to uh, Brett Nevy, David Page, Pierre Williams, and Emerson Spire. Um, without uh, their contributions to this presentation, it certainly would have had more words and static images uh, than what I'll be able to present to you. Um, all right, so uh, like Wes mentioned, uh, I'm the original facilitator of the uh, extreme environments uh, focus group within LSIC. Uh, Jamie Porter is now in that role, although I am uh, remaining as the focus area lead uh, for the um, the uh, the LSII efforts that we do here at APL. Um, and so, in the extreme environments focus group, we're really focusing on on these technologies um, that are needed to survive and operate in extreme lunar environments. So, when there's a workshop uh, like this. It's uh, we really get very excited and, and want to be involved because as we've gotten more and more into this, we realize that the strength of the extreme environments group is in our knowledge and taking a systems level approach to solving problems and helping define uh, environmental requirements that that can then be designed to. Um, and to do this, we've uh, like most of the uh, focus groups have, we've formed subgroups. We are actually the first focus group to, to sort of form subgroups. Um, and uh, our, our subgroups fall on kind of different aspects of the lunar environment. Uh, so the, uh, those aspects that, that we focus on are the radiation environment, the regolith surface interface, so how uh, technology interacts with the surface, Space weather plasma environment, which is going to be uh, important for today's talk. Thermal and illumination, which is the main focus. Uh, vacuum exosphere environment, including testing. And a brand new subgroup that's going to be kicking off uh, this fall, at external hazards. So, so things like uh, micrometeorites, uh, coronal mass ejections, things like that. And these subgroups are uh, community-led. Um, two of them are led by people at APL. Two of them are led by academics. And two of them are led by industry. And of course, we have our, our confidence page. So that's the extreme environment. Thank you for, for getting us involved with us. Um, so for the, the talk today, uh, I've broken it into two kind of general parts. The first is the general lunar environmental conditions. I'll talk about the thermal environment, uh, some considerations for illumination, and then also what the uh, surface charging uh, plasma environment looks like. And then we'll focus in on the poles, uh, since that's probably uh, the greatest interest for um, a lot of people on the call and talk about surface temperatures, illumination, and, and surface charging, and also some regulate. All right, so uh, we're, we're very fortunate here in, in 2022 to have had an instrument fly and orbit the moon and measure the surface temperature at, at moderate resolution um, so that we really do understand what the, the uh, thermal environment is of the moon. Um, so this is uh, data from the Diviner Lunar Radiometer, um, the Deputy PI of, of Diviner, and this provides uh, information of the temperature of the very top surface. There is additional information that can be gathered from other instruments, including microwave radiometers that have flown on two of uh, the Chinese lunar orbiters as well that could provide information at depth. But most, most people are concerned about the very top surface since that's the, the aspect of the lunar environment that's radiating onto their uh, technology or their payloads. Um, the map that's being shown here is a bolometric temperature that's calculated from using seven uh, discrete multispectral channels, and uh, it's showing how the temperature changes over the course of a lunar day. Um, so a couple things to note here, and, and there's a little bit more detail on the next slide, 
is that equatorial daily maximums get quite high, uh, just about 400 Kelvin. Um, temperatures are higher in the Mari than they are in the highlands, largely due to the, the darker albedo of the Mari. Uh, at the equator, the nighttime minimum temperatures can dip down below 100 K. And those minimum temperatures will, of course, be lower as you increase your latitude. Uh, the lunar day, I'm sure everyone knows, is quite long. It's about 14.75 Earth days. So if you are in an area um, that receives kind of this typical cycle, you have very long periods of illumination and very long periods of shadow. If you take a look at that, that same data, but split up by latitude, you can see a little bit more of, of the complete story. So here the, the trends are, are, are colored depending on latitude where black is uh, zero degrees latitude to the equator uh, going up until you get to 85 degrees latitude. Um, and here you can see this, this latitudinal effect in terms of both the minimum and the maximum temperature. Uh, so the equator is warmer, uh, both when it's illuminated and when it's uh, shadowed. And as you go to increase in latitudes, your maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures both get lower. But the other thing that, that really comes out of here is that the variance of the temperatures within um, these pixels also are increasing too. Um, and that's not uncertainty. Those the, the measurements that Diviner makes are actually certain to generally much less than one degree Kelvin. That's really the variance within um, those regions that are being bent together. And the main thing that's causing those variants is topographic roughness that leads to some parts being illuminated, some parts being shadowed, some parts being tilted towards the equator, some parts being tilted away from the equator. And one of the things that really pops out is when you get to high latitudes, and if you look over at the plot on the right, um, is that this, this variation um, can be quite large. So this is being defined as a standard deviation, but really it's variation in temperatures. Um, you know, plus or minus 50 degrees Kelvin across the entire illuminate, illuminated period, because some of the parts of those pixels are fully in sun and they're 200, 250 K and other parts are in shadow and they're less than hundred K. And so you get these very large variations. Um, at the equator, you do see large variations, but they're associated with uh, both dawn and dusk. So when you get near the terminator and shadows become more important. Um, and you don't need to have necessarily all observations. There's been a lot of efforts that have gone into estimating surface temperatures. And one of the ones I wanted to bring uh, to the attention of this group uh, is actually a, a really useful and easy to use um, uh, analytical function that was developed by Dana Hurley um, seven years ago uh, that reproduces with reasonable accuracy the temperature for both. There's two different equations, one for the illuminated surface and one for the nighttime surface. And this is uh, derived from fits to the diviner data. And so it gives a very accurate answer, can be very easy to calculate. And if you're looking at first order considerations for your technology, this is often good enough. Uh, as you get more into the development, you'll want more rigorous approaches. Certainly, there's been a large number of published approaches that involve 1D or 3D thermal modeling. Um, the Lunar, uh, lunar Thermal uh, Guidebook uh, also has approaches and recommendations on the number of um, layers you should be including in your, your models as well. But for a first order, first cut, this is really useful. But I do have to say that we've been talking about regolith temperature so far, and it's important to keep in mind that lunar regolith has extremely low conductive, thermal conductivity. It's uh, not quite as low as aerogel, but it's very close. And whatever technology you're sending to the surface is probably not going to behave like aerogel, unless you're sending you know, a couple centimeters of aerogel and that's your experiment. Uh, your technology will probably have some level of thermal management system and its temperature will not get as low nor as high as the regolith is getting that's right around you. And so there's definitely a moderation that needs to be taken into consideration. So when you are um, coming up with what say survival temperature ranges should be, uh, using the regolith temperature is not a good approximation. You should do at least some back of the envelope calculations on, on what your thermal management system will be able to provide. Um, now that said, the regolith temperatures should be used to constrain uh, the thermal flux uh, that your TMS seeds. And that is, uh, of course, would be a best practice and the higher fidelity after that, the better. 
In terms of illumination, um, I already mentioned this, if you're at mid-latitude, you have these long periods without direct solar illumination. But that's not to say that it's completely dark. Uh, it's actually quite a bit of light on the lunar surface, depending on where you are. Um, the main sources are Earthshine, if you're on the near side, Lyman and Alpha, if uh, you have sensors that can see into the UV, or is a diacolite starlight. And the Earth, if you're on the near side, produces a tremendous amount of, uh, of lux. So if you think about a full moon and how bright that is, that's about equivalent of having a 60 watt bulb, about 10 to 15 meters overhead. The Earth, on the other hand, having a much larger solid angle and having a much higher albedo is more like having a 60 watt bulb only two to three meters overhead. And so it is much, much brighter. Now, of course, if you're on the far side, you don't have that, but you still have starlight. And um, as you get you know, towards the terminator areas, you would have uh, less just because the Earth's uh, light would be spread out. But it's, it uh, shouldn't think about these um, nighttime periods as being pitch black. Um, they will actually have quite a bit of light. And um, the other thing there is that even though there is a lot of light, there's not a lot of heating power. So uh, it does not really affect the temperatures very much, either of the nighttime surface or the areas in the PSRs. Um, the calculations I've seen on that are, are that it's really just a, a couple degrees Kelvin for PSRs and even less for the nighttime surface. Um, and then so related to the illumination environment uh, is also the plasma environment. So the solar wind is coming in and you have uh, photo emission on surfaces that are illuminated that creates a positively charged surface. And on uh, the night side where you don't have that, you get something that's negatively charged. So you have a weakly positively charged surface or you have something that's strongly negatively charged. And this creates you know, potential. And um, you can have these potentials over quite short distances if you're near the terminator or near the poles because you can have illuminated and shadowed terrain um, very close together. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, temperature effects, temperature uh, relationships in how much energy can be stored up in the regolith with this potential uh, before it actually arcs or creates little lightning. Um, and uh, and that is most likely a, an effect more for the permanent shadow regions, but it potentially could happen on the night side if there's a, a large enough solar event occurring. Um, for spacecraft, this is also a concern because you're potentially making your own shadows or you have part of the, the spacecraft that, or lander or technology is illuminated and part of it is not. And so you're gonna be doing the same process as well. And probably the, the, in addition to the direct effect of charging, um, you also have, dust issues, because the charging will affect if dust is uh, sticking to you more or less if it's being levitated in your area. These are all very open and uncertain questions at this point. So if we zoom in on the polar regions and go back to temperature, um, I, I love showing this animation, which is a high resolution um, 3D thermal model uh, and um, that has been matched to diviner observations. Um, a couple things to pull out of this. One, the PSRs are always cold. Right now, they're this purplish color, but as the you know, time of day changes, they can become a little bit warmer. They can get bluer, um, but they're always cold. Um, and then the other areas, the ones that get even small amounts of illumination, alternate between having these bluish colors, which is generally 100K or, or less, and going to red, which is 200K or higher. And so it's actually kind of hard to be on the lunar surface and have the surface be in the 100 to 200 Kelvin range. It's really a, a, a transient um, temperature range between when something gets even a small amount of illumination and when it gets no illumination. And so you can see you have these red areas that once the sun is set, there's a green tail and it, it's basically following these red areas around. So when you are designing for the for the polar regions, you should be thinking that when the sun is up, I'm going to be in the 200s, and when the sun is down, I'll be um, the the regolith will be uh, in the 200s, and when the sun is down, the regolith will be below 100. And um, this is some more da data from uh, Diviner that's published a few years ago by Pierre Williams, and this is to show the differences uh, that happen with seasons. So the moon uh, does have a one and a half degree tilt to the ecliptic. And so there are um, seasons on the moon and there is 
there are areas very near the pole that can have significant effects. So this is the South Pole. The map on the left is minimum temperature. In the middle is average temperature. On the right is maximum temperature. And during summer, you get the maximum temperature is very similar to if you've seen a map that says these are PSRs and these are not PSRs. It's very close to, to that result. Um, and if you look at winter, though, the area is much larger that, is, that are these very cold temperatures. Um, and, it's, uh, and that's just because the sun is not coming over the horizon for these areas at these times. So I can flip back and forth a couple of times and you can see just how much larger these areas are. Uh, another thing to note though, is that for the average temperatures, um, if you were getting some sunlight during the winter, you probably are also getting some sunlight uh, during the summer as well. And if, unless, if you're very near the pole, you may not, but if you're further away from the pole, you will. And there's a, a interesting um, series of, of images that have been pulled off the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera um, to show this effect. So this is now the North Pole. Whipple Crater is very close to the North Pole. It's kind of like Shackleton is to the South Pole. And then Perry Crater is a larger, uh, more complex uh, crater um, just to the, the south of Whipple Crater. Um, and this is looking at a particular uh, subsolar longitude. So this is a particular time of day. And then what's going to change between the images is the subsolar latitude. So that's going to mean we're looking at the same time of day, but different seasons. So this would be northern summer. Then as you move to something that's more like uh, an equinox time frame, uh, same time of day, but you can see the difference in the amount of illuminations available as you go to something that's a little bit more. And then you can get down to northern winter, exact same time of day, but now you have very small amount of light compared to what you had for northern summer. Um, so that is something to keep in mind um, that uh, there it may be <laughs> more likely to have a, a six month mission than have a 12 month mission just because of the seasonal effects. Um, it's been uh, demonstrated for quite a while um, now that, that we don't expect there to be peaks of eternal light on the moon. Um, there are some small regions that can be significantly illuminated uh, over the average. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that even getting just a small distance above the surface can start to really increase the, this percentage of illumination. So height helps. I know everyone on the call who works on VSAT, vertical solar array technologies, know that height, height helps. And there are, uh, there are heights at which you can start to get really, really high percentage um, illumination. Uh, the other thing um, you can do is take advantage of the fact that while any given spot might not be illuminated um, above 70% of the time, uh, it is possible to have spaces, areas near each other that would be illuminated. And so there's been some work to go into, mostly for rover traverse planning, um, how far you would need to go in order to basically stay in illuminated regions uh, perpetually. And so there's a little animation here on the right, so I can get it going, um, that shows a, a rover traverse where you start off and you kind of are hopping around to different illuminated regions um, to stay in light. And just by doing this within this kind of circular region, which can repeat itself, you can have uh, illumination for 94.4% of the year. Um, this is a, a similar tactic to what's being pursued by lunar, uh, uh, that will be pursued by Viper on the lunar surface in a couple of years. Um, so while rovers might not be um, as applicable to the discussions today, it is analogous to distributed networked power system where you do have uh, power systems that uh, are in different areas that have been determined to have illumination and, and overlapping uh, times where uh, at least one or a portion of the network is illuminated. Um, and in terms of other polar considerations, so we, we talked about uh, the plasma environment and solar wind uh, for the terminator. Um, the poles are essentially always terminator. And so whatever effects end up being important for that are going to be even more extreme uh, at, the, at the poles. And um, so you can have these, these strong potentials. If you do have infrastructure that is connected in a physical way, you could potentially have conduits for potentials moving around. Uh, the tribal electric charging, so the, the amount of potential you create just by moving across the lunar surface um, might be greater in the polar regions than was observed uh, it, during the Apollo missions at the equator. 
Um, that's a, a really big open question. And the dust and regolith properties might also be different from the Apollo experience. There's, there's some evidence that suggests that um, because the uh, space weathering environment is different at the poles, that the regolith itself may actually be somewhat different in terms of maturity and particle size and things like that. And certainly within PSRs, there's evidence that the porosity of the surface might be significantly different than it is in the illuminated region. All right, so uh, just to, to wrap things up here, um, the lunar environment is complex. Um, you know, depending on, on where you are, there's going to be distinct thermal illumination and plasma environments, and they will vary with time. Uh, some of the other aspects of the environment, like radiation, um, are not as time dependent in terms of their variation, but these ones do uh, change. And um, the thermal environment is something we've been studying for a long time. We have a lot of experience with observations and models, and you can you can trust that that what what uh, is what can be modeled at scales of tens of meters is pretty accurate. The area where we have the biggest questions are on the really really fine scales. Theory would suggest that you can have um, thermal temperature differences on scales of centimeters, where because the regolith is so insulating, you could have uh, you know an area that's shadowed, an area that's illuminated within a, a couple centimeters of each other and maintain that temperature difference. And therefore, it is possible that there could be um, very, very small shadowed regions um, on the, the submeter scale. And so that's an area that we really can't do anything more uh, from orbit because it's too fine scales, and it will take some surface uh, observations to answer. Um, the surface plasma charging characteristics, regular dust properties, and polar regions have large uncertainties um, and are extraordinarily difficult to, um, to study experimentally in the lab. Uh, so one of the things that is going to be required is, is sending some missions down to close some of these knowledge gaps, and a certain amount of learning through flight experience is required. And I think that meshes very well with what NASA wants to do through the commercial um, lunar uh, surface payload providers, the CLIPS program, um, by getting some payloads down the surface, making sure we fully understand what's going on before we send humans back to the moon. All right, so that's uh, that's what I have. Fantastic, Ben. I feel like, I always feel a little awkward that I can't give proper applause at the end of, <laughs> at the ends of these talks. So um, yeah, thank you very much. There's there's a question in the chat, and I had a couple other that I, I'd like to to take your perspective on and a reminder to the rest of the panelists we still have about seven minutes so so if you have questions please put them into the uh uh into the q a um so uh anton forgive me if i'm, I'm mispronouncing that asks uh you mentioned height helps get more illusion uh, getting more illumination assuming being on the top of a local maxima what would the height uh, uh what would be the height required to get to 95% uh, illumination throughout the year, 99%. I think he's referring to a, a single location, not the complementary uh, uh, sets. So uh, yeah. Have... Go ahead. Yeah. So, so that's you know that's certainly a problem that a lot of people have been looking at. I don't have those numbers in front of me, um, but my understanding that it was on the order of tens of meters. It wasn't necessarily you know like a kilometer in order to get to some of those, but it is very, very, very location dependent. Right. Um, and and I would ask, you know, kind of as a follow on to that, you know, we have some models for these uh, illumination. We have some nice illumination models. How robust do you think they are, and what if anything needs to be done with respect to validation, so we can know just how far up we need to go and get those um, power cycles and so on? Yeah, I mean, so for the illumination models, and especially if you're interested in in um, you know what the power would be produced above the surface, are already at really good fidelity. So there, there's the two, there's kind of two components to them, but three components really. There's uh, how well you can model the horizon. Mm -hmm. And because the horizon is far away, you don't have to have super high resolution to be able to model that really well. It's how well you can predict the position and size and extent of the sun. Um, and it's uh, then the one that, that requires the most precision is the uh, elevation of the surface beneath you. Mm -hmm. um, but with the data sets we have in the polar regions, I feel like we can can do that for for these things that are above the surface, like two meters above the yeah. surface. I don't see much improvement coming there okay. for the, for the what the illumination environment is right at the surface. 
that's where we can see improvement by having even better, more localized data sets. So, so what you would ex expect if you're not modeling with, with a high degree of fidelity, what's happening way out at your horizon, if you're standing up off, off the lunar surface, would you be subject to short, you know, periods uh, intermediate? Like you have an idea of exactly when you're going to go pretty dark, but you know, when you're kind of traipsing that line, you know, there are some technologies that really do depend on on continuous illumination. I mean, this is now more for like ISRU with carbothermal. They depend more on having that and that kind of uh, continuous illumination. Um, is that where you would expect there to be some issues or? Or do you think that that it's, you know, it's still like, OK, it's still generally going to have kind of a nice edge to it. And maybe there's a little bit of flutter around it, but. Yeah, I mean, it's a valid concern because shadows in the polar region of the moon, you know, they they move surprisingly quickly, yeah. considering that, you know, the moon has a 14 day night cycle. Um, so, yeah, I think you would want to consider um, shadows coming in uh, to your local area as well. Right. I mean, the part of that matters because, you know, there's potentially energy storage uh, implications for that as well. Um, so there's a couple other questions coming into the Q&A. Um, one's from Brian Turner. Do we expect uh, dust to pile up uh, kind of like snow drifts? Um, I guess this is maybe a more a question for Jorge, who's our dust uh, uh, group, but maybe you can uh, mention briefly about uh, regolith and how it might uh, pile up. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the thickness of the top dustiest, uh, you know, lowest conductivity surface on the moon, you know, the thickness varied over, over the Apollo sites, but it still varied within a relatively small range. Um, what it is in the polar regions, it could be, that layer could be thicker, um, but you still have all of the naturally occurring regolith overturn phenomenon that are happening as well. So if it, if it were thicker, that would imply that the dust levitation, le dust movement rates are much, much higher than I think what most people are expecting. Okay. Um, there, there's quite a few questions that are coming into the chat. We won't have time to get to all of them because we just have a couple minutes left, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more and then you can try to answer some of them um, sort of asynchronously as the, the panel's kicking through. Um, so there's a question, will there be some generalized tools made public for temporal analysis at specific locations? Um, I don't know. <laughs> if, they, <laughs> if it's something the community wants, uh, they should make that clear. And then NASA can, can do that. There, there are some tools that are already available. Uh, the, you know, for instance, I mentioned the Lunar um, Thermal um, Guidebook or Toolkit. Um, there's also Moon Treks, which has a bunch of illumination capabilities built in where you can put in a location and, and it will model what the illumination is for you. Um, so there are some tools out there, but if there are specific tools people want, yeah, these, these exist and it's just a matter of, of getting them put together. Right, and I think that that's a really good point is that if you, if you see a need for something like that, this is exactly the forum to call out that you need it. We will communicate that up. This is where we can, where we can have that. Uh, have that conversation. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Yep. Um, that was really wonderful. Lots more questions if you if you have uh, a chance to get to them. Yep, will do.